Well, a very good morning and thank you so much for tuning in to Media Monitor where we give you 60 minutes of analysis of stories that have kept us talking all this week. I'm Anisha Jali. Here's what's coming up on the show this morning. What does the recent conflicting remarks from the ANC about the Kosatu's support for Deputy President Sir Ramaphosa as the next ANC president mean? We interrogate the Reserve Bank's unchanged repo rate which sits at 7%. What are the possible implication, implications of IPID's probe into acting National Police Commissioner Komuzo Pashani? And finally, we look at the very controversial Limpopo Doom Prophet Letebo Rabalajo of the Mount Zion General Assembly, who was pictured spraying doom on uh, members of his congregation. But first, as always, let's take a look at the news headlines at 900 hours. Cuba is marking nine days of national mourning for its revolutionary leader and former president Fidel Castro, who died at the age of 90 yesterday. Castro's remains were cremated and his ashes will be taken around Cuba until a state funeral on the 4th of December. Western diplomatic officials said foreign dignitaries will arrive by Tuesday for a memorial service to be held in Revolution Square that evening. BNC has confirmed that its consultative conference is now set to form part of the party's policy conference next year. The conference is expected to take place in June, where issues facing the party will be discussed. NC veterans who met with President Jacob Zuma in the past week asked for an urgent consultative conference in order to highlight issues plaguing the ruling party. And these include how the NC lost key metro municipalities in the country in the recent uh, elections uh, in Uganda, as well as the state capture report. And residents of Kuha municipality in the Eastern Cape are getting behind the idea of a nuclear power station in their region. Tastebent near Cape St. Francis has been named by ESCOM as one of the preferred sites for a nuclear power station. The Tastebent Nuclear Development Forum was launched this week to support the building of a nuclear plant there. And chairperson of the forum, Pumzile Olifant, says it will boost the economy and infrastructure as well as create jobs in the Guha municipality. However, a rival group, the Tastebent Alliance, has now been formed to oppose this project. Coordinator of the project, Trudy Malan, says a nuclear development will have dire consequences for the environment in the area. All right, let's welcome our guest this morning. We welcome Sophie Mokwena, SABC Deputy Political and Foreign Editor, as well as Political Analyst, Mr. Dumsani Shope. Very good morning to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Morning, Hi. Alicia. Morning to the viewers. All right. And now for a quick look at the big hashtags of the week. And for this segment, we present you with Mr. Neil Mutloum, SABC Multimedia Producer. Good morning, Neil. Good morning, Alicia. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm just anxious <laughs> to get going. What was big? in terms of the trends this week. We're starting with the prophet of doom, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, this topic was so big on social media that it had so many um, um, hashtags of its own. And one hashtag that was pulling traffic is things that needs to be doomed. Mm -hmm. And people are talking about uh, skin lightning needs to be I doomed. I see they I brought mean, back our kid. Yeah, they brought back our kid from Uganda and yeah. he went viral a few weeks <laughs> back, but now he's back doing social media rounds. And there are more tweets actually. Um, Let's have a look at those tweets. What are they saying on social media? All right, while we wait for the tweets, I just want to hear quickly mm. from the panel. Sophie, what did you make of these latest developments here? Well, it's no surprise. I mean, we have many uh, churches that have kind of sprung up all over the country, but in the con on the continent in particular. Mm -hmm. I think it all has to do with the challenges we are facing as a nation, but also uh, as the continent, where people are so desperate at mm. times and they think anything can assist them and they would uh, align themselves with anything that they think it mm. can help them. I mean, it's, it, it, it's unfortunate because it's exploitation of people, particularly black people. Mm. When are we going to stop? Mm. And we are going to talk about this in more detail, but just a quick review of what you saw in social media, Dumsan. Well, this week... Um, <laughs> 
on the pastor of doom what did you make of the reaction look, 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 look two things for me I, I think it showed how vulnerable black the black poor are mm -hmm. but secondly which is even more important for me is that with social media we are now able to transmit information as and when things happen yeah. and as a society we are able to take action you know immediately but i also think that the police did not come to the party because they could have arrested him that was a criminal act mm -hmm. it was nothing religious about it we want to hear more of that when we actually discuss that he says it's a criminal mm. act well, what were the people saying on twitter this is what people are saying female friends that act like our girlfriends but do not give us the benefits of a girlfriend mm. those are things that need to be doomed <laughs> all people who think exile was jail enough for them to now eat our tax money things that needs to be doomed those are just some of the comments that people are making light of the issue on social media mm. Mm, all right, well, we are going to discuss that topic further later on in the show, but give us the next big hashtag of the this week, Neil. The next big hashtag has to be Black Friday. I mean, it was big news. I mean, everyone was at well, the mall. I missed it. I was at work. As, as you can see in this video, people are <laughs> running up and down. This was a peak and pay. I mean, people are coming in to do their shopping. Um, there was one lady who said she was in the queue for an hour just to do her shopping. And it's basic things. It's like food, you know, basic South African things that people need. But it was a big hashtag on social media. Mm. Um, if you look at the map, this is the map where it all trended in a, across the globe. Yeah. We have them in South Africa, Nigeria, and some parts of the Eastern and Europe, especially America, because, you know, Black Friday started after the Thanksgiving yes, ritual. Yes. So, but it has spread all around the world. I mean, even in Australia, except people Russia. are taking part. Except <laughs> Russia. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't, I'm not even sure if they have Twitter that side, but it's not trending there at all. <laughs> Sophie, did you take advantage of the Black Friday? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> you were at work. <laughs> I was at work, but I also don't believe in Black Friday. I mean, you just end up buying stuff that at times you don't need. And mm. also... Yeah, there's a debate in terms of uh, what this is all about, mm. how it originated, and the history behind. And I still have to do my research until I'm convinced that it's not true what I had. Maybe I would consider next year. But the reality is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a capitalist society where people are being forced in different ways to mm. spend, you know. And indeed, it worked for capitalists. You sound like a chief economist. I'm sorry. Well, what did you for, think? For, for me, Black Friday is a black problem. <laughs> Why? <laughs> be, 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 because it, it entrenches this consumerism tendency. I mean, it's very interesting that the people that are managed were not actually too visible in all of these places. And then I think there's an element of truth. I, I did a I asked a few professors at UNISA about the history of Black Friday. Yeah. And they, they, they had quite consensus that you know it is linked to the auctioning of slaves uh, uh, way back in the US yes, where yes. people were, were auctioned and then and there are actually some pictures that we, we, we show so there is evidence uh, and I think we're just too gullible in this in this continent in South Africa that things that are thrown at us you know we easily swallow them we have got your idols you have got the, in the whatever housewives and all of these things we just swallow we just swallow so I think at some point we just need to make things happen for ourselves. So for me, it just marked strongly, you know, that we're a consumer society and we're going to swallow anything that is thrown at us. Including but also it speaks to how vulnerable we are mm. as a society. As a society. And particularly on the continent, the challenges we face. I mean, some of people who went there, it was all about ensuring that they get what they need most. Mm. And this is the only time we can afford. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. All right. Well, she's got a change of heart. Yeah, Probably is. see her shopping next year. What was the big and final uh, one for this week, Neil? I think the biggest one was for Dal oh, Castro, yes. who passed away yesterday. But mm. in, in Kuba, it was on, it was uh, on Friday. Friday. Yes. So at Digital News, we created a timeline that illustrates his life, um, the people he's met, and the contribution he's done, not only just uh, in Cuba, but also in Africa. So if you want to see this, you can go onto our SABC digital platforms. Mm -hmm. But looking at stats, um, in one minute, in two minutes, actually, after the news broke, over 1.5 accounts were reached on social media. But mm. that's just a small number because it's an on ongoing story. So the hashtag does grow as time goes. But people in South Africa, particularly, when we look at South African tweet Twitter, they yeah. are saying he's not just a Cuban hero. Like this tweet says, he's an African and a Cuban hero. Rest in peace. 
may the soul of a gallant revolutionary hero of the liberation of Cuba and South Africa, Fidel Castro, rest mm. in peace. So people in South Africa are really touched by the story and are really sending out their sentiments on social media. Mm, Sophie, we did a whole uh, dedication to him yesterday here on the channel. I mean, take us through what you saw on social media. Yes, indeed, uh, South Africans in particular really appreciate the fact that uh, he played the part in liberating the uh, Sadek region in particular. And uh, uh, we spoke to the head of state, uh, President Zuma, last night at 8, where he spoke about the role that uh, Fidel Castro played in mm -hmm. ensuring that we are free. We spoke to the former president, Thabo Mbeki, also relating his encounter with uh, Fidel. And then, of course, President Obama in the U.S. issuing a statement that was very, uh, what, diplomatic. And mm -hmm. you had... Uh, uh, the president-elect uh, Donald Trump, you know, I don't know. I'm st yeah, I'm still trying to understand mm. uh, Donald Trump. Okay. You have uh, <laughs> president, uh, the uh, president Holland. You know, many, 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 many messages. But also Julius Malema writing a, a letter to Raúl Castro. You know, a very, very moving mm. letter. All right, a very quick one, Tim Sunny. Well, well, I think there's a lot to talk about Fidel Castro, but uh, one thing in particular for me is how the Cuban forces in Angola, they played a very instrumental role in actually embarrassing the apartheid military regime, which, mm -hmm. which, which contributed greatly to the withdrawal of the SADF at the time and to the subsequent negotiations in South Africa. Mm. So, so he is a, but also, I think for me, it marks the era of the end of heroes. I I don't think we will still have heroes in that space, you know, in that space uh, as we have known so all far. All right, all right. Well, that's where we leave it now. Give our viewers once again that you are uh, where they can get all the information that you've given us this morning. They could just go to www.sabc.co.za forward slash news. That's where they'll right. get everything. Thank all you. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us now. Hopefully, thank we're going to see you next week. After the break, Kosatu calls for Ramaphosa to lead the ANC. Stay tuned for that. Celebrate the holidays at Macro with big festive season savings like a Johnny Walker 18-year-old platinum label whiskey gift pack with two glasses, only 949. Save 50 Rand. Johnny Walker Black Label Whiskey Gift Pack with two glasses, only 290. Save 20 Rand. And Johnny Walker's best-selling red label whiskey gift pack with one glass, only 180. Save 20 Rand. Share in these and other big festive savings for home, for business, for life. Only at Macro. Big on life. Welcome back. Now, Kosati has formally announced their backing for Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa as the next ANC president. This despite the Federation's noise about factionalism within the ruling party. The ANC has since come strongly out against Kosati for their very public endorsement of Ramaphosa. Here's more on this insert. The collective of the ANC, they should be able to take this decade as a decade of workers. How other people feel about it, who other people nominate, I think you have to ask them whether they think and what is the criteria they want to. You can't ask us about people who have not, we have not nominated. You can only ask about our, our own preferred uh, or recommended candidate. We keep on raising this issue of Marikana when the commission was put in place and you don't, you can't, you can't move away from it. And, and Cyril himself was never found killed. So things will continue to be raised. Uh, it doesn't matter who leads the ANC. Because what we understand is that the war is not against individuals, but against the African National Congress itself. South Africa is ready 
for a woman president. We have been ready as women since 1994. And we think that uh, as the Women's League, because we'll be rallying around a woman president, will engage in proper processes with the African National Congress when the issue of lobbying starts in the ANC. We'll definitely do that. We are members of the ANC and will be everywhere in the country, in every branch, lobbying the structures of the organization. Quick reactions, Jim Sani. Well, well um, I, I think the, the, the race is in full swing. Yeah. Uh, and I think the ANC has lost its control and the leadership of, of, of this race. And uh, the third thing I think is to Muslim Lamini within uh, Kwasato, he is also not too in charge anymore because he was not very keen to have this pronouncement made. And I think there, has been, there might have been some serious discussions within uh, Kwasato and he might have lost there as well. So I, I think the race is in full swing, and the, the ANC leadership cannot constantly say that you know people are speaking out of ten, because these are proper structures of, of the ANC, uh, of, of the alliance. Now, at a bigger scale, it means that uh, the ANC is not managing leadership and management succession properly. This is why different structures and partners within the alliance are able to bolt and they say whatever they want to say within this, within this whole you know, leadership succession issue because the, the, the center right now is not holding. But that was to be expected because President Zuma is serving his second term. So he is an, he's an outgoing president. He's not just a president. And in most cases, when a president is serving his second term, his influence and the impact and control of the organization gets weaker and weaker. This is why you hear a whole lot of people making all sorts of pronouncements. He must resign. Some are saying that they are beginning to make choices about who should take over him. So, so they, they, like white people say, the horses have bolted. Hmm. Sophie, what do you think of that? I mean, he thinks the party policies are to blame uh, in terms of leadership within the party. Well, I think I agree with uh, Dumisani. The reality is when you are on your second term, it becomes a free-for-all because mm. there's contestation. Mm. Those who want to continue uh, to be in the leadership of the party or in government or in any structure, therefore, it's very difficult to contain the debate. And uh, I'm surprised because uh, I think at some point in time, after the Polokwane and the uh, Bloemfontein conference, Kwasatu said... Uh, they will not uh, involve themselves in pronouncing, you know, the leadership of the ANC. But here we are again talking about COSATU being the first alliance partner structure to pronounce. I mean, we're still waiting for the SACP. I'm not sure they will do the same. I'm just saying not even ANC branches or regions or provinces have done that, but uh, here is Kosatu making a, a statement. And it speaks to, like Dumisani said, the center is not holding, but also mm. the interest of different individuals and mm. uh, alliance partners, because you want to make your voice heard so that you can start uh, popularizing your candidate, because the more you delay, the more uh, you have problems going forward to popularize your, your candidate. So. Yeah. Uh, the Secretary General of the ANC, Gwede Mantashe, is trying very hard to try and manage this. But, yeah, it, it's happening. People are talking. You have the Women's League. Uh, uh, they were very careful not to pronounce names, but talk about the principle. Yeah. And that's what Gwede said. Uh, it must be about the principle, not names. And therefore, they say uh, a woman based on the fact that they have to fight for the rights of women. Yeah. But uh, names are doing the rounds, we know. Mm. You, know you know what's even more interesting yeah. for me is that, you see, members of COSAT are actually ANC members. So when COSAT leadership says that, you know, um, we are going to mobilize within the structures of the ANC, that's, that's precisely correct because those people are actually ANC members before they are, you know, before they are COSAT. 
They've, they vote with the ANC. These are the people that actually participate in the structures and processes of the ANC. Now, we have been saying in the last year or two that uh, Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa does not have a, 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 a dominant constituency within the, the, the ANC to bolster his you know, presidential chances. Now, this does him a very huge favor because it means that as, an organiz as individual COSATO members, mm -hmm. they can then begin to strongly argue and motivate for him to, to, to be the next president. Mm -hmm. So his chances are slightly, they, they just got a boost, so to speak. But, but Dumsan, I want to hear uh, your views on this because a lot of, uh, and Sophie just spoke about it now, a lot of people are asking when it comes to, to the alliance, is the ANC losing its grip on its alliance members? I, I will definitely uh, think so. Um, not, not only within the alliance, not, even the leagues. I mean, the MK veterans, they can speak as they want to speak. In fact, even cabinet ministers, they also release this press statements, you know, to say the things that they want to say. Mm -hmm. um, Sabin's is one, is one of them. He had to be rebuked by his own cabinet. So, 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 so it's not simply that, you know, ANC as a leader of alliance is battling to control and manage their lines. It's oh, also it's battling to control and manage its own particular leagues. Mm -hmm. So the center is not holding. And by the way, this means that in the next few months, you will not see an ANC that regroups or, or, or self-corrects because of this contestation for leadership. Mm, and while we're on that, uh, we know that uh, Kosatu has been losing uh, members in, in large numbers. We know that uh, what happened with Numsa, uh, do you think this could be one of the reasons that uh, they've now decided to actually listen to what their members are saying? And uh, what does Kosatu stand to lose given their decision to announce their preferred candidate, Sophie? I don't think uh, this has got to do with uh, them losing membership. It's mm -hmm. just the culture of politics. That's the culture of politics. Mm -hmm. People are interested in influencing power and authority. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you can do it. You know, Kosatu has got a constituency, yeah. working class. They want the needs of the working class to be addressed. And for you to be able to influence government to hear your constituency uh, 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 Concerns, you have to have someone who can listen to you, and it's, it's all about that. Mm. You know, there was an interesting uh, call, and I think you mentioned it, Sophie, earlier this week. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, the women were saying maybe it is time to break uh, the the nomination uh, tradition by not uh, having the deputy succeed the president. What do you think that uh, can do, Dumisa? Well, there are, there, there's a whole lot of things that should change in the ANC because the ANC is still operating in the 80s model, mod, modus operandi in 2016. Mm. And this is partly one of the reasons it's losing the metros and the center is not holding because... So they need to reform they, it, Absolutely. And, and the ANC has been talking about modernizing and modernizing, but without necessarily... Uh, uh, you Implementing. Know, uh, uh, exactly. Mm. So... so <sighs> You know, it's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting if you look at the case of Nkosa's Lamine Zuma, because if, if you look at her performance, um, I mean, she has been, she, she, she qualifies. So, she, I mean, she has been a minister of, you know, international relations. She has been at home affairs. She has been a minister she's of the health. She's the chair of the She has been the chair of the So, essentially, she's well vested with how government is run domestically, continentally, as well as, well as internationally. Now, there's no better person that one can think of in terms of having been there from day one, you know, to be able to do all of these things. Mm -hmm. The other person that we don't actually talk about, interestingly, is uh, Jeff Hadebe, you know, in the presidency. I mean, he has been there since the days of Nelson Mandela's cabinet. And he has held some very, very serious portfolios like justice, transport. And now he's a de facto prime minister, so to speak, mm -hmm. in the, you know, in the office of the president. So we, we have got all of this, but this is the problem in this country. In this country, when we talk about leadership and succession, we start with individuals rather than where we should be going as a society. Mm. So we throw names around without giving substance to where should the country be going. Mm. All right. Well, that's where we're going to leave it on that subject. We're going to take a quick ad break. And after that, Moody's ratings agencies have kept South Africa's sovereign rating unchanged. More details after the break.
Hindu devotees took a holy dip at Sangram, the confluence of rivers Ganges. People and priests made their way to the banks before the break of dawn. Security arrangements were in place for police forces patrolling on the river banks to ensure smooth function of the event. A mobile museum in India's West Mumbai is highlighting the skills and creativity of residents of one of Asia's largest slums. That's what we've been doing here, is creating this platform and we came here to, to help it develop and to, you know, just build it up. You're still with Media Monitor. Let's talk economic news now. The Reserve Bank has left interest rates unchanged, keeping the repo rate uh, at which uh, the central bank lends to commercial banks at 7%, which leaves the prime rate which banks lend to consumers at 10.5%. Credit ratings firm uh, Moody's has also kept the country's sovereign rating unchanged at BAA2. And that's just two levels above sub-investment grade with a very negative outlook. Now, Fed ratings agency also revised South Africa's outlook to negative from stable. Fed says political risk to standards of governance as well as policy making have increased. A negative outlook is basically a warning that the next move could be down. But here's more in this insert. Features say the infighting within the ANC and government will likely continue into the next year. It's concerned that this will distract policymakers and lead to mixed messages that could undermine the investment climate and constraining GDP growth. Reacting to Fitch's move, the National Treasury says efforts made by South Africa to keep the country on an investment grade have paid off. The department says government, together with business, civil society, labor and politicians, continue to work hard to build the foundation for faster growth. Economists say the move by Fitch will increase the risk that borrowing to plug the budget deficit will be more difficult. They say government bonds will not be so attractive as there is a risk of getting returns is likely to be negative. It's likely to pull us further down towards non-investment grade, so-called junk status. I don't like the sound of that, but certainly non-investment grade, and that's going to make it all the harder for us to attract foreign capital. With all three rating agencies now having a negative outlook on us, it means that the chances of a downgrade obviously increase quite significantly. It looks very, very likely now that we are going to go into a non-investment grade in the next year or so. Announced that Standard & Poor's has downgraded the company's long-term corporate credit rating to BB from BB+. Gloras Fakomosi, SABC News, Johannesburg. All right, and for this segment, let's now welcome Dr. Azar Jamin, the Director and Chief Economist at Econometrics, uh, to give us uh, an analysis of the outcome of the credit ratings agencies. A very good morning, and thank you so much for joining us this morning, Doctor. Good morning to you and good morning to the listeners. Look, Doctor, what's your view on the outcome of the ratings agencies? It's a mixed one, clearly, thus far. Uh, the Fitch one uh, was a very distinct warning to us that uh, we have to get our political house in order or else we will be downgraded. The fact that they put us on a negative outlook is a warning that there's a significant chance that they will be downgrading us, and uh, they made it quite clear what the factors were, mm. and they said the political infighting could have a negative impact on uh, economic growth by virtue of the fact that it is distracting uh, the attention of politicians away from doing what is necessary to improve our economic uh, growth, and if economic growth uh, falters, then of course government revenue growth will also falter and that in turn will make it more difficult to bring down the budget deficit. That in turn will make it more difficult to constrain the rise in the public debt. And the other reason they said political infighting is uh, adverse is because it's leading to mismanagement and uh, a lack of corporate governance at our state-owned enterprises, mm. when they get into trouble, they have to uh, bank on the government to bail them out uh, uh, financially. Yeah. And that, in turn, results, uh, also contributes towards a rise in the public debt. And when you bear in mind that 
what ratings agencies really are trying to do is to provide a measure of the chances of government uh, going bankrupt or, uh, in, or investors not actually getting their money back for, by buying government bonds, uh, then uh, clearly if the public debt rises, this does impair the country's solvency. Mm, look, Doctor, a very quick one. Uh, uh, what were your thoughts on the MPC's uh, decision to keep the interest rates uh, unchanged? And what does this mean to, to our economy? I think it was a no-brainer. I think every, uh, most people expected there to be absolutely no change in interest rates. On the one hand, uh, inflationary pressures are turning out to be less than we had anticipated at the beginning of the year. Uh, the RAND has rallied quite nicely, and also because of the weakness of the economy, businesses are finding it very difficult to pass on uh, cost increases. But on the other hand, uh, we also know that the election of Donald Trump as President of the United States in the future, uh, he has promised uh, huge infrastructural spending coupled with tax cuts, which means that U.S. interest rates might rise much more sharply and faster than previously anticipated, and that could put substantial downward pressure on the RAND. Mm. Uh, so there's no way that the Reserve Bank can afford to cut interest rates at this stage either. So, you know, with these countervailing uh, pressures, uh, quite clearly the, uh, policy, the right policy is to just stay put. All right, Doctor, a very quick one before I let you go. Now, we do know that uh, before the ratings agencies came, we were projected a 0% growth, and we actually grew by almost half a percentage point. Does this mean that uh, we are starting to move towards a positive area? And what do you think was done right? Because we do see that unemployment is still very high. Uh, I do believe that the worst may be over for the economy. We no longer have a drought. Uh, there were uh, statistical factors that depressed growth in the first quarter, which are no longer there. We don't have electricity price constraints and the fact that uh, electricity supply constraints and the fact that we uh, don't have uh, inflation as high as we had anticipated that it would be at the beginning of the year. And because of that, interest rates have not been rising. Um, we, you know, there's a bit of breathing space for the ordinary man in the street. Mm. And you must also bear in mind that the RAND is extremely cheap by historical standards, even after rising somewhat since the beginning of the year. And this creates a wonderful opportunity for exports to improve. And already we've seen our trade balance improving. But at no stage one must, must one think that we are moving towards a boom uh, mm. All we are saying is that we might lift off from 0 to 0.5% 0 growth to somewhere in the region of 1.5% uh, to 2% over the next couple of years. And uh, Now, bearing in mind that the economy needs to grow by more than 2% merely yeah. to absorb uh, new entrants into the labor market, uh, one realizes that even if the economy starts doing a little better, it, may, it w is unlikely to be enough to prevent the unemployment rate from rising still further. Mm, In okay. order to really um, uh, diminish unemployment, we have to embark upon real structural reforms, such as improving education skills uh, uh, outcomes, such as improving the adversarial labor relations between workers and employers, which mm. date back to the inequalities created by the apartheid era. Doctor. And as we've seen with the minimum wage debate, uh, clearly there's huge challenges because the one side doesn't see the solution uh, in the same way as the other side does. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for your analysis this morning. That is uh, Dr. Azza Jamin, the Chief Economist at uh, Econometrics ZA. And he's talking to us about some of the latest developments when it comes to ratings agencies rating us. What did you make of those developments, Dumsani? Do you think we're in a good space, as the professor says, we are starting to, to work towards a positive area? As, as an optimist, I will say yes, but, <laughs> but, but I think we are still performing below par, mm. uh, comparing the, 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 the massive potential of this economy. He says now we have to grow by over 2%, which is uh, yeah, but a massive it, it, number. It, it, yeah. it, even there, I don't think when it comes to our competitiveness, I don't think we are 
we, we, are, we are playing the game to our potential. And I think this country, I mean, this is the launch pad of, you know, to investment within the continent. Yeah. Um, I mean, our, 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 you know, banking infrastructure and system is up there with the best. Our telecommunication is up there with, I mean, we practically, our infrastructure in terms of what the president and Becky used to call the first economy in this country is actually up there, you know, with the best. Mm. Uh, and so the question is, why is it that we are not performing as, as much as we should? I mean, I, I still don't believe that we could have easily been overtaken by Nigeria and Egypt at some point for us to become number three, yeah. you know, as a country. So, so the, the, there, are, there are a few things that I don't think, maybe a whole lot of things that we are not doing properly. But it was interesting that uh, what he says that, you know, uh, the politicians must get their act together. Because yeah. there are two issues here. I think one is a question of perceptions. The, 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 the constant detentions among politicians, you know, where, when you have got a situation where, you know, the dominant narrative in society says that the Minister of Finance is being pitted against the President. Mm. Now, now, those are the people that should be the closest in the Cabinet. Those, that should, that, those, those are the institutions that should be the closest in the Cabinet. So those, you know, those, um, you know, perceptions have to be managed quite carefully. Mm. But on the other hand, we are also saying that the institutions of democracy in terms of the judiciary are working very well. But as much as we think that there's a danger that the more we burden the judiciary with political and administrative legal cases, we are going to actually crash the judicial system, which should be working quite properly. Mm. So we have got two things to deal with in this country. One is the reality that you know, we must grow the economy, the SMMEs must work, we must produce the skills that are required by and we must build a productive society rather than a Black Friday consumption society. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and yeah, this country has so much potential. And as President Tabombek said about three weeks ago, that we must have an implementation plan for the National Development Plan hmm. and keep it going. Sophie, what did you think? Is, is really political noise that damaging? Yes, I think uh, the good thing is that it's something that you can deal with. Yes. It's almost like an internal, it's, it's a local issue. But if it was uh, the economic problem, I would be worried because mm. with economy, you are not independent. You rely on others. You know, we are part of the global village and at times we have no control over. But because it's political infighting, it's up to the governing party to ensure that they deal with these issues speedily so that there can be that kind of, uh, uh, you know, confidence that the country is going in the right direction. Mm. And it's simple. ANC can deal with this. And like Dumisan has said, I mean, uh, the perception that, well, in public, President Zuma and uh, Finance Minister Pravin seem to be okay, but it's not true. It, it worries uh, uh, people who are supposed to invest in the country. And I'm saying, I think what the ANC must do is to ensure that, particularly also this issue of succession, because with my little experience, having been a political reporter, the problem is a succession debate. Mm. When it starts, it really affects you know, everything yeah. because of contestation and different interests and people, individuals, business, politicians, yeah. you know, uh, the international forces, everybody wants to influence the outcome thereof. Therefore, if the ANC can manage this thing of, you know, the succession quickly, I think uh, come June, when they come back, uh, things will be much better. All right. Well, no, Dumsani, that's where we're going to leave it on that topic. We're going to take a quick ad break. And after that, we look at why the IPED is charging acting police commissioner Pashani. Stay tuned. This is not fair, Santa Bosizan. That's fair. Who could put the rent to 200? I was going to put the rent to 200. Who won? Who won? 
150, 150 plus colony. Let me another one. I'm just the one to lock you out. Yes, I'm just the one to lock you then out. Who are starting gangsterism? No! No! Welcome back to uh, Media Monitor. Before we go on to our next story, Dumsan, you wanted to add something very quickly on the, on the, the Very story. quickly, part of our problem in this country economically is that the private sector with its trillions of rains is not investing in the South African economy because of this mistrust between the business elite and, and the, the political elite. So, so the bulk of the business people, they've got one leg in and another one in London. Mm. Uh, and uh, like feeling like any any time things might collapse and they can just go wherever they want to go. So so that problems of of South African business people not investing is a in South Africa is a bigger part of the problem. Mm. All right. Well, mm. that's Dumsani's views on that topic. There now another big story of this week was of course the IPED announcement that it is probing acting National Police Commissioner Komoto Pasane. Now this follows Robert McBride's return to hit the IPED after being cleared by the courts and he's coming back with his guns drawn. The IPED reportedly summoned Patlane to its offices to provide a warning statement with regard to charges of defeating the ends of justice. Now, this comes after the report that uh, the commissioner allegedly contacted witnesses who form part of an IPED probe as to how Patlane could afford on his police salary an 8 million rand mansion, as well as paying for some of the construction with cash stuffed into plastic bags. Forensic investigator Paul O'Sullivan alerted the iPad about Patlane's corruption. What did you think about this? <laughs> um, Is there a case for Patlane to answer to? Well, well, well I think anyone who lives above this means uh, there is a case you know, for, 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 for an investigation. And I mean, one of the things that have been said in this country quite several times is a lifestyle audit because people are actually living above their means. Uh, which means they are getting money somewhere. Uh, and so it, it could be a genuine you know, investigation. But the problem is that most of these investigations happens within the polit toxic political environment. Mm -hmm. so, so even the narrative here, it says that now that uh, Robert McBride is back, is trying to deal with it, those yes. that are So mm. we are not looking into the substantiveness of the investigation and the charges. And that's part of the problem that we face in mm. this country. So, Sophie, what is the substantive argument then? No, it's all the political climate. I mean, some may say McBride is hitting back. And it's a revenge he himself... Time. He found himself in this situation earlier on because some people were saying somebody is uh, dealing with my pride. So that's the problem. That is why the ANC has to resolve the current political climate so that when anything is done or any action is taken against anybody, there are no question marks or some suspicion and we can move forward to address whatever problems we have. Mm -hmm. But right now, uh, the climate is so polarized in any sector, any institution. And like Dumsani said, now the judiciary is almost like running the country because they have to intervene mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. And uh, uh, the former deputy uh, uh, chief justice, Ndatedi Kham Seneke, raised this issue last week to say, no, ho, ho. Can't we find a way to resolve? And the court must be the last resort. Mm. But mm. unfortunately, you must go and check. If you were to do an investigation in terms of cases that have been laid in different uh, police stations, because people are just like, uh, it's a tit for tat. Yeah. Number, I don't know. I'm sure even those investigators don't know where to start and where to end. Mm. You, Dumsan, you know, uh, just to take you back to your previous point, you said, you know, people are living above their means. Isn't it normal uh, uh, for civil servants to declare their assets uh, before they take on government jobs? Do we know the value of his assets? Do we know that he can't afford an 8 million rand house? 
Well, we, we, we don't know, um, but the assumption is that he can't afford. Um, but you see, this is why... Based on? Well, be, be, based, based on, on the police's well, salary? Yeah, apparently some of the reports indicated that he can afford the house around the two million around in that area. Uh, and therefore it becomes questionable <laughs> why he affords, you know, an eight million. But you see, he, he, he is not alone in that space. Uh, there are a whole lot of deputy directors and supply chain in the public sector that, you know, are driving some big machines and are living in some serious mansion. And Nobody's no matter how much questions. you advertise the director position, they will never apply because they are comfortable <laughs> where they are and they are earning more than a talk show host like yourself. So, so, so. That's so, so sad. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you see, the bigger problem for me is, is that with all of these things, before, when, when someone is being charged, there is the narrative that says, who did he upset? You know, who's trying to get back at him? And I think for me, that's a very horrible narrative. Mm. Because when someone is being charged, you know, the question is, what are the issues on the table? So the same thing applied to Praveen when he was being you know, investigated and all of that. The narrative was that, you know, he, you know, he's fighting some people that are trying to loot the treasure. So you, you, you don't get to a point where people are saying that, you know, here are the issues, here are the facts, you know, he, we, we just get stuck, you know, in the narratives, mm. which is unfortunate. Mm. Sophie, I mean, it's now IPID versus SAPS by, by the look of things, and it, it's bringing uh, the judiciary into question again or into the limelight again about what's going on uh, within those organizations. If the matter ends up in court, indeed, it will be uh, time for judiciary to look at the matter. But for now, it's between the two. Mm. And uh, let's hope between the two, finally, uh, the truth will come out. And uh, this morning, I was listening to SAFM, and uh, there was a report after they spoke to the person who made these allegations and presented them to IPAD. And then there was a statement read that uh, Pahlani is saying his house is three million. So like Dumisani is saying, you have to go and do the audit and check who's, you know, the truth behind this whole thing. Mm. But the reality is it happens at a time where there's a serious political uh, polarized uh, climate that mm. affects all institutions. Mm. And this matter has been uh, highlighted by the ratings agencies. I mean, mm. I'm, I'm not making it. It's, it's a fact. It might even affect families. Who knows? Maybe in South Africa, many families are divided because mm -hmm. of this political climate, because people share yeah. different views and interests, you know. So, it, yeah, it's 10 years to the uh, governing party conference, or if the president is on the second term, there's this uh, noise. I think uh, the country has to find a way. Uh, we have to learn from mm. the experiences of the past. But the source of these tensions, you know, Judge, is the fact that the private sector is not creating enough jobs for everyone. Back again mm. with right? the private sector. Yes. Mm. So what happens when you become part of the political establishment uh, and you, become, you enjoy a high position in political and the state leadership, you have access and, to con and control of resources. So all of these battles, uh, these people begin to fight for top positions because it allows them access to, to ownership and control of, of, of resources. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the for, for the same reason that in many other parts of the African continent, we have had civil wars. People fighting over state control because it will allow them to have a house with a swimming pool, for example. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so this contestation <coughs> just, so they, they, they won't end any time soon when <laughs> Getting into a top political position means that you are becoming a top dog mm. in, your, in your personal income. Mm. Sophie? Yeah, it's true, but uh, we have to say this. I mean, we have to locate the problem, and that's where the problem is. Yeah. Whether there will be a solution to that or it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just being optimistic. <laughs> it's a reality. It's, it's, it's all the political battles. Because indeed, if uh, I'm able to influence power, I will get something in return. All right. Well, that's where we're going to leave it uh, on that topic. After the break, charismatic churches continue to honk the headlines. I'll be back with that after the break.
Whether you're looking for a restaurant, public transport or a university, a lot of us use our smartphone apps to find the closest one. On network, which are to those who play a role in Africa's tech space. We have taken financial services closer to the people. Yeah, mobile penetration is pretty high. Apple take 30%. Uh, keep 70%. On Network, we give you Africa's social media and technology news. That's Network with Ms. Pumela Lezondi every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Central African Time. Welcome back to our final segment of Media Monitor. Now, there has been an outcry following the emergence of pastors around the country who use questionable and very controversial ways to heal worshippers, or so they claim. Now, this led to the Commission for the Promotion and Protection of Cultural, Religious, as well as Linguistic Communities, the CRL, being tasked with probing these pastors, as well as their unusual practices after complaints by the communities. Now, some of them have publicly been feeding congregants grass and snakes, and making them drink petrol. I mean, but yes. what do we attribute this to? Well, the, it's the vulnerability of the poor. Uh, with someone coming and promising them heaven and, uh, on, and earth on earth, they will jump to that. But my issue is we, society shouldn't allow criminality to happen under the guise of doing a God's work. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you are going to spray people with a poison or something like doom, that's a criminal <laughs> act. If you are going to take a live rat and feed it to people, that's, that's a criminal act. It's, it's, it's not an act. It's inhumane. I'm soon people, I mean, there's another one who drove, you know, a car, you know, over a congregant, you know, as part of demonstrating his powers, blah, blah. That's an act of criminality. So arrest these people. Hmm. Jail them. Sophie, are they criminals? They are doing wrong things. Whether criminal or not, I think the court can pronounce. But the reality is they are doing wrong things. Mm. Doom is not meant to, you know, spray people. I mean, really. I mean, really. Mm, mm, mm. But now, what is the purpose of the CRL Commission if it has to wait for the congregates to approach them? Why can't they just institute investigations or, uh, or have a, a, a sort of uh, a way, uh, um, what can we call it, a legislation in which uh, ch churches operate under? The, the, look, my, my understanding of this commission, they are not supposed to police. They are supposed to promote you know, mm. the manifestation of these religious and cultural, you know, <laughs> issues that we have in society. The policy, the policing is for the police to do. It's, yeah. not, it's not for the commission. Mm. So why are they there then, Sophie? Also, why is everybody giving them those uh, cases to probe then? But also must look at powers and functions. And I agree with uh, Dumsani that they are supposed to promote culture and religion and uh, any form of belief, not to, 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 to punish people for believing or being uh, religious uh, leaders or taking a position on culture. Mm. Uh, but those issues must be in line with the constitution. We can't abuse people. This is abuse. Pastor, this is abuse, please. Stop spraying people with doom. All yes. right. Um, so you're saying, uh, uh, um, you're thinking that, uh, do you think that religion has gone to the dogs, Dumisani, quickly? Well, I think religion can be used for anything. Mm. Uh, and, and I think in, 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 in the last few years, there's been a serious commercialization of religion. Uh, I'm also tempted sometimes to start a church to make money. <laughs> I mean, you don't even get taxed. So, 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 and most of these charismatic churches are just commercially driven. Mm. Sophie, let's look ahead. What do you have coming up for us in this week? Thank well, I think... The ANC and EC, which yeah. is currently underway at the, in Pretoria at Irene, where they are discussing lots of uh, issues around how they can ensure that uh, they address the challenges the ANC is facing. Mm -hmm. The issue of the funeral of uh, Fidel Castro, uh, ZANU PF, uh, going to the conference. Uh, we have uh, uh, Donald Trump there, who is president elect, and uh, on the 20th of January, he will take office, uh, but already there was an announcement that uh, people have called for a recount. Mm, and what do you think is going to come up this week, Dumsan? Pashani versus McBride? Are we going to get more details into that? 
Um, if there are any details. Yeah, but I, I think the narrative will stand. Um, and and, and that the, I think that narrative of, of, of the struggle in, in, inside the institution will continue. All right. Well, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, Domisani Lope, as well as Sophie Mugwena, joining us here on Media Monitor for sound analysis of the news that made you talk throughout the week. Thank you so much for watching our show, Media Monitor. We hope that you join us again, same time and place next week. That is right here on the ACBC News Channel. I'm back at the top of the hour with AM News. Stay blessed.